mentioned it here. <laughs> cool. I think we're recording, hopefully. So, um, Lecture 16, Support Vector Machines. So, let's slowly work through that. The point with support vector machines is some of the language. We'll talk occasionally about support vector classifiers before we get to support vector machines. So, you know, just be careful with your terminology, not that it makes much difference. So we've got to build up, and the first thing we're going to do is we're going to look at what they call a maximal margin classifier. So we're going to start with a hyperplane. So let's imagine I'm in p-dimensional space. So this would be the number of features. A hyperplane is going to be a flat affine subspace of dimension that's one less than the dimension we're in. What's an affine? Affine means it doesn't go through the origin necessarily. So normally a subspace will always go through the origin. Zero vector will be contained within it. Affine basically means it doesn't go through the origin. It doesn't have to. But other than that, it's just a linear combination of dimension one less. Like you know what it is. You just We never use technical terms. So, for example, if p equals two dimensions, a hyperplane is going to be b to zero plus b to one x one plus b to two x two equals zero. And you could rearrange that into terms of the standard thing of a line. You know, if x two is y, you could rearrange that into just a line. And the key thing about this line is it doesn't necessarily go through the origin. The fact we have that b to zero makes it affine. Okay. So if I have a p-dimensional hyperplane, it's just going to be a linear combination of all the predictors. So b to 0 plus b to 1 x1 plus b to 2 x2 plus. But because it equals 0, because we have that linear constraint, it has dimensionality p minus 1. You know, by saying it equals 0, constrain it. Or you could also say the linear combination of the x is equals minus b to 0. If that makes you all feel happy. But we want to have that equal 0 because it would be useful when we look at stuff. And then I can say, well, is a point in that hyperplane? Fine. I take that point, and if it satisfies that equation, it must be on that hyperplane by definition. Okay. So we're going to use that. How are we going to use it? Well, here's my first example. Here is a very simple, I've got two predictors, x1 and x2. I have a single um, hyperplane, which is 1 plus 2x1 plus 3x2 equals 0. And then you can think about your space of x1 and x2, which is your Cartesian plane, and you could define all the points that are either on the line, they're above the line, and by above the line in this sense, it's basically that 1 plus, for all these points that are red, 1 plus 2x1 plus 3x2 is greater than 0, and then below the line, all the blue points are less than 0. And the idea of this hyperplane at this point is it takes this R2 and it splits it into two regions. Okay, And we're going to use that for classification. So imagine now I have some data. I have some predictors. I have um, n observations and p predictors and these are all contained in a matrix x of size n times p. And then each point is going to be classified and I'm going to classify it. Normally we do 0, 1 but just because it made the maths nice, you have two possible classes, minus one or one. And the thing we're gonna do is say, imagine I've got these points and I can find a hyperplane such that all the points that have one lie to one side of the hyperplane and all the points that have minus one lie to the other. So you could go back to that, you can have all the points above would say one and all the points below. If I can find a plane that will do that, so in two dimensional space, imagine I have my points and I can put a line between the points. So it separates the points. So one side of the line is all one class, one side is the other class. I'm going to call that a separating hyperplane. Okay. So here's a very simple case. I've got two predictors, x1 and x2. You've got the red points and the blue points. And you can see here, I've got three separating hyperplanes. These planes at the moment separate the regions. So all the blue points are in one region, all the blue red points are in the other region. Not, not just three, right? 
No. Okay. There's a few more. There's an infinite number of separating hyperplanes. Good, good. I use three to represent infinite. I should have used four to use the standard, you know, right, statisticians like... one, two, three, infinite. Right. But, you know, I just, they're very hard to draw. I'm stupid, I do every point one by one. So there's an infinite number of points on the line and that's what takes the time. <laughs> so, really nice point though, is there's an infinite number. You know, you could all come and choose one and there's an infinite number in this case of separating hyperplanes. So can we then now go to the next step and say, well, is there a really good one? So first of all, before we do that, let's just recap what we've got. Separating hyperplane has the property that first of all, the B to zero plus B to one for all the observations is greater than zero for all the cases where Y equals one and it's less than zero for all the ones that is minus one. Or I can write this in one single equation, this is why we set up with the minus one one, is I'm saying that the separated time plane is a property that yi times by that linear combination of the predictors plus the b to zero is always greater than zero. Just a nice way, of, that's why we classified minus one and one. And how do we classify? If you come along with a point, I put it into the equation, and then I go, if you are greater than one, we will, sorry, if you, I apologize. If you're greater than zero, we'll classify you as class one. If you're less than zero, we'll classify as class minus one. If you're zero, if it just so happens you lie on the hyperplane, there isn't any idea. There's no standard what do you do at this point. To be honest, I just toss a coin. The other thing is, if you think about it, if you look at the magnitude of that, so instead of just saying that you're greater than zero, if you put your values in and you got something like 100, you'd have that sense of, you must be a long way away from the hyperplane. Therefore, you're pretty happy with that classification. But as we said, if you were zero, we wouldn't know how to classify you. If I got a value of 0 0.00001, you go, you're really close to that hyperplane. Maybe I've misclassified you. So just as a, a, a note. So let's improve this. Let's have a maximal margin. So what we're going to do is we look at these infinite number of hyperplanes and we'll say which one is furthest away from our training sets. So I want to look at the distance between my hyperplane and every point and find the one that maximizes that distance. So you find in the line that sits further away from the data. Pretty well, it's, if you imagine your data points, it's halfway between them exactly. The interesting thing is, if you think about it, when it comes to that calculation, imagine I had my line, and then I took a point that was a long way away, and I moved it a little bit. It's not gonna change anything, is it? In fact, you'll find that eventually, it's only the points on either side that are close to that really lock it in place. And these points that lock it in place, the ones that are actually important in deciding it, are called the support vectors. Because they support that hyperplane. They're the ones that lock it in place. And if you think about it, if you had your points and you had your place locked in, you took the other points and moved them around, you wouldn't change anything. So any points that lie on the margin, and the margin is that distance from the point to the hyperplane, any points that lie actually on that margin, we're going to call support vectors. So I'll wait. You sure? So here's the actually an optimization problem. I want to maximize the margin where, first of all, I'm going to add some constraints. I'm going to add the constraints that the sum of all my betas equal one when I square them, so square, add them all up, so my linear combination, such that yi now, instead of being greater than zero, is greater than some margin m. So the idea is I, I look at all my hyperplanes and I find the one such that, under the constraints that the coefficients squared add up to one, I basically found the one that is furthest away from all my data, my maximal separating hyperplane. Where do we get the constraint from? Um, just because 
Um, I'm trying to think if there's actually a really good reason for it, and I can't remember when I read the textbook if they actually said why they do that constraint. Other than, I suppose, it's to make it identifiable in the coefficients. Because you can find that separation in hyperplane, and that, I'm wondering whether you could adjust it to move it across. I'll have a look, see if I can find out. Let me put a note and see if I can actually find out if there's a, a good reason why they choose that. Cool, I'll see if I can get back to you. I'll put it on Slack. <sighs> okay. So, so far, we said you got your points, you find a separating hyperplane. Then someone complained because there was an infinite number, which wasn't good enough for you. So, we went, fine, let's lock it in and find the best separating hyperplane. What do you do when you can't separate the points? Like, the concept is good. This idea that you have some sort of hyperplane that separates the points. But sometimes you're just not going to find a point that can separate them. So, let's take this framework and just adjust it so we can do that. So what we can do is we're going to have a soft margin. And the idea is now that you will sort of go, I don't mind if some points cross the margin or even cross over the hyperplane, but let's try and minimize that as much as possible. So find the best separating hyperplane so as far as possible from the training data and minimize the number of violations of that. So almost you go, I've got a couple of points that sort of squash over the margin or even worse, cross over the hyperplane. Let's reduce that as much as possible. And when we do that, we now call it a support vector classifier. We still haven't got support vector machines, but we're heading in the right direction. So I still want to maximize that margin. I still got my constraints on the coefficients. I now want my yi being greater. Remember, we started with greater than zero, then we had greater than m. Now it's greater than m times by one minus epsilon i. Where epsilon i is to some extent accounts, it's, it's slack variables that account for the fact that every swap can have these violations. They have across the margin or even worse, they cross the hyperplane. What we'd like is the e to i to be greater than or equal to zero and we're going to have a constraint on the number of violations because our e i's, sorry, our epsilon i's measure where we make, we have a point that's just not sitting nicely. So we want to minimize the number of violations. So C is going to be a non-negative tuning parameter. So what does it mean, these slack variables? Well, if your epsilon i equals zero, the point's fine. It's on the correct side of the margin. If it's greater than zero, it means that it's gone over that margin that we had but it's still on the right side of the hyperplane. If your epsilon i is greater than one, you're on the wrong side of the hyperplane. And you're just counting these. It's like, okay, I've given you a little bit of slack. Oh, I'm happy with that. You can have a little bit of a mess up, but I'm keeping a, an account. And I want that to be less than some sort of cost, some sort of C. So now we've got support vector machine. So, so far, let's do the framework. We said, you've got this basically hyperplane, which is, think of it as a plane or a line or the equivalent. It's not curved or anything at the moment. It's nice and flat, which is a structure that lies and it separates your p-dimensional space into two parts. And originally we say you could separate, if you can separate all your points, so the ones above are one, the ones below minus one, perfect, you've got separate from hyperplane. We then reduce that from infinite down to one by just saying, find the one that separates them that's furthest away from all the points. Then we said, but we've still got this nice flat structure. Then we said, fine, now we'll let some of the points either get too close or even cross over, but we'll now try and find the plane that separates them as best as it can. Up to this point, it's all been flat. We have a hyperplane is a flat type structure. There's no curvature in it. Now we're gonna do support vector machines. We're gonna start looking at non-linear decision boundaries. 
So instead of RP predictors, you know, quite happily in the linear regression and stuff like that, you could also think about your squared terms. You could have two P predictors, where you have every predictor and the squared predictor. Now you'd be looking at a linear combination of those, and now your boundary is no longer flat. It's curved. But think about the other way. Instead of thinking about it's starting to get all curved and horrible, it's still flat, but it's flat now in a bigger dimensional space. We've gone from a p-dimensional space to a 2p-dimensional space, and we're still trying to find a soft margin classifier that's flat in that 2p-dimensional space. Now, the problem is, when we come back to our p-dimensional space, what was flat then suddenly becomes curved. Because it's still flat, because it's still a linear combination of these features. It's just now we've gone into a higher dimension. So we, we go up to a higher dimension, we find a nice, flat, separating hyperplane. But when we come back to our dimension, it might start to look curved. In fact, you might find it gets a lot more weird than curved. So here's my optimization with just the square terms. Still the same sort of thing. All I've done now is I maximize my M. I've got constraints on the coefficients. But now my hyperplane has square terms in. But it's still a linear combination of those features. It's just that some of the features are now squared. And again, it's greater than M, 1 minus my epsilon i, where my epsilon i let us have violations. So is that the epsilon i that goes with one particular beta i, or...? The epsilon i would be the... Because I thought every term had a... Epsilon i in that one, I'll have to check that, but the that should be a j there. i should be for every observation. So the yeah. epsilon i is for every observation. So i is for the observation, mm -hmm. j is for the features. Okay, and so I'm just wondering why there's only one e epsilon i in that right-hand side. Because I'm going to look at each of these things for each point individually and then add it up. Right, yes. So presumably oh, yeah. beta j1 and beta j2 is a one and two bit typo. No. Two different yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, they're fine. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the typo here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In the spot the typo gave, you just you dropped the ball. It was an easy one. Well, you should also have the. What about your beta j2s? Is there a condition on them? Their squares being equal to anything? No. Okay. No. This is this is this is all it is. That's for their beta j1s. Oh, I see. No, no, no. Uh, that I don't know actually. I copied this from the book. I will check that one as well. That's the typo. This is probably a mistake. Different thing. There's a lot of work to be done. It's lovely to do slides. It's very hard to type so fast. Okay. To make this a bit easier, we're going to look at, because I don't want to keep writing out, as you can see, typing these takes time, and I don't always get it 100% right. We're going to just recap the idea of an inner product. So what is the inner product of two observations? So I've got two vectors, x i and x i dash. And I take the inner product, which I've denoted by my angles there. And that just means that I basically take each of the individual elements and I multiply them and then add them all up together. So that's just my inner product. I'm about top setting there with x i prime j. I really don't know about that time it's top setting there, Jimmy. What? What's wrong with that? There's nothing wrong with that. What, you mean the, the, the extra space there? Yeah, no, I'm not, it's not sold on it. You want me to get rid of the space? It's hard because you have to do weird things in the last step to sort of drag it back. Sorry. So this is not, it's not a typo, typo. No, it's, it's more typology. I don't <laughs> think... Uh, do you know I once had a deliberate mistake in the exam because I spelled the word deliberate wrong? Gary pissed himself. I think it's the only time I ever saw him really actually laugh. He went, I found you a deliberate mistake. Yeah. And I'm like, I didn't even realize that spelled it wrong. And then I went, oh yeah, I spelled deliberate wrong. It's a deliberate mistake. But he did think it was funny. Well, it's his own joke. That's why he's laughing at it. Yeah. I just don't think Tony would be happy with that. You're actually going to turn into Toby. 
<laughs> are you are you actually is you got a t-shirt under that saying what would Tony want? <laughs> no. But it's beautifully typed. <laughs> <laughs> in blue at the side. <laughs> Just down here. In what would mind. Tony want? <laughs> And there's, there's no like you know clear page or any of that stuff. They need the band commands. It wouldn't use them. You only gave us a, a list of band commands in Reset Methodology. I hope he gave it you without using the band commands to actually give you the list of band commands. Uh, it was on a website, so. Ah, uh, okay. I like that. You brought them up. He has a lot of opinions, does Tony? Well, we all have opinions. He just likes to voice them very strongly. Yeah. I once remember him. This was years back. We were discussing, I think, which languages to teach the first year students. There was me, Matt Rowan, and Tony Roberts. <laughs> and Matt said something. And Tony just turned around and went, Yeah, but that's why you're not a professor. And me and, and Sam Co were there just drinking our wine and just went, And that's why we will always be scum. <laughs> I was like, Oh, wow. Although my favourite story about that is Ben Rorlach didn't realise that associate professor is below professor and he was talking to Inga Cock once and he called her professor and then thinking he made a mistake he went, no, sorry, associate professor. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. He didn't even realise. Weeks later we were talking about this and we said, yeah, of course you have associate professor and professor, you went, what? He went, yes, he's associate professor, then professor, and he went, Shit. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we've got this inner product. And um, once we've got over the synesthesia of Josh to my <laughs> typo setting, let's have a look. You can rewrite your, we're going all the way back to the support vector classifier. You can rewrite that now in terms of our inner products. So remember the whole thing, if we assume we've got a separating hyperplane, I can separate it, I can rewrite this whole thing in terms of a beta zero plus an alpha i to separate it, and the inner product of each, my new point I'm going to predict, my x, and my xi's, which is my training data set. And in fact, the nice thing is, is you'll find that all them alpha i's are zero. The only time they're not zero is the supporting vectors. The nice thing about this separating hyperplane when I'm using it in a product is I only really need to keep track of my support vectors. And if you only have like two or three or four support vectors, that's fast to calculate. Okay. So now we get fucked up, to use a technical stats term. Let's have some generalized inner products. So an inner product will have certain properties. We are just going to take two vectors. And if I remember my general rules, is an inner product will return a real number. It will be a positive real number. That if I, first of all, if you put in two vectors and it's the same vector, it will give you zero. So you've got the fact that if you give the same vector in, you'll get the value zero. Everything else will be non-zero. It will be symmetric. So if I work out the inner product between vector one and vector two, and in a product between vector two and vector one, you get the same answer. That's it. It's in a product basically form a metric. And I also believe that they form a proper metric. So you've got so far you've got they, you take two objects and return a real number that's greater than or equal to zero. So only equal to zero if and only if they're the same object. They are symmetric. So it doesn't matter if I do the inner product of x and y or y then x. And finally, you have the triangle inequality. Triangle inequality basically says the length of any side of a triangle is less than or equal to the sum of the other two sides. And metrics have our concept of distance we have all along. You know? The, dis the symmetric, the distance from me to Ben is the same as the distance from Ben to me. Triangle inequality, the distance from me to William is less than or equal to the distance of William to Ben and Ben to me when you add them together. That's it, that's the metric. So here's some things we can start doing. You can have the linear one, which we just said. So you've got K now, it takes two points, and it just basically multiplies each element, adds them up. You can have polynomials. So here's the polynomial kernel of degree D, which basically says you give it to, remember all these things is, I'm just giving two vectors, 
and it will spit out a positive number. Don't get overly confused about what they mean. They just have these nice properties. You give them two objects and they spit out a number and you can think of that number as the distance between them. It might be the distance between them in some fucked up dimension, but it's still a distance between them. So you've got your polynomial and you've got your radial. Okay? What's gamma? Gamma is a tuning parameter. Just so you have different radials. You'll see that in a second. So now let's, we've got our setup. So all we're doing is we take our points, we're going to convert them into some fucked up dimension. We're going to find ourselves a nice hyperplane, a little flat structure that separate the points. And when we come back, that separating hyperplane might not be this nice straight line. It might be all fucked up. They're support vector machines. But the general concept is we find a nice flat structure that separates the points as best as it can. So here's my points. These are simulated data to start off with. And we have two predictors, x1 and x2, and two classes. We have the red points, which are class minus one, and the blue points, which are one. Cool. So how do you actually do support vector machines? It's in the E1071 library. Oh. I never know why it's called that. And I, I believe it's a joke. I believe it was actually either the name of their department or the office. So um, look at it, I can't remember, but it has lots of, and one of the things it has is support vector machines. So the command to use is SVM, support vector machines. It is one that takes the formula notation. So I'm going to do Y tilde dot, so Y and all the other things in my data frame. I tell it my data frame. And then the kernel is the type of inner product we're going to use. So we're going to start with a nice linear one. So we're going to fit something that will give us a straight line between these two points. I'm not going to scale, and I'm going to have my cost, so that's my C, if you go back to optimization, to be 10. So I'm quite allowed quite a lot of violations in my points. Is that right? Oh, I'm probably going to get that wrong. So you call it, and it will spit out. Notice the one key thing about it. First of all, it tells you how many support vectors, the number of classes, it tells you all these things. The thing about support vector machines is there's no explanatory side of it. There's no indication here that it says, I tell you what, when it comes to classification, X1's really important. You've lost that. We're now in the stage where you have lots of flexibility, it's really good for prediction, but you lose that explanatory nature of this. And I have had that problem. I use support vector machines to classify, as we all do, classify DNA of bison to decide if they were step or non-step bison. Classic problem. And then they using SNP data. And they went, that's brilliant. Can you tell us which SNPs are most important? Nope. No, I can't. I can predict, if someone turns up with a bison and DNA sample, I can predict whether it likes living in forests or not. But what I can't do is tell you which of the SNPs are most important. And I think that's the problem with support vector machines, is it really loses that explanatory nature. Great prediction, no explanatory. So here's my nice little bit of code that will take that and it will produce my prediction. So here's your line, the line between the red and the blue bits. And the way this predictor will do, it's a linear predictor, is anything in the blue region we would predict to be class um, one, anything in the red region we would predict to be minus one. What I've done here is I've got the points with their original values. And so you can see, for example, um, in the red region, we've got a blue square. The square indicates it's a support vector, and obviously it's on the wrong line of that hyperplane. It's actually being predicted to be minus one when its actual value is one. Are those red ones coin flips, or are they just secretly on? They're not on the line. Yeah. They're, they're not on the line. They're not to coin flips. So anything that's a square is a support vector. So it means that if I, to some extent, took a circle and moved it so it doesn't cross that imaginary line into becoming a support vector, it will not change that line. You can move them around, and that prediction is not going to change. Now, obviously, if I took one of these red circles and pushed it closer and closer to the venture, it crosses that soft margin, it would now become a support vector and hence it would change everything. 
So the next thing you could do is you could try a different cost. Now I've got a cost of 0.1. And this way I think I'm getting the cost wrong in my head because now I have more support vectors. Is that right? I always get confused with the cost. Not that it really matters because we're going to tune it in a second. So now I've got my separation hyperplane. You can see you've got the blue region, you've got your red region, you've got more support vectors now. And you can, the question you have is, well, what cost should I use? You've now got, as always, a tuning parameter. So classic ways, what would you normally do if you have a tuning parameter? CB. CB, exactly. And you can always tell it's a standard when it gets built in. So there's actually um, a tune parameter to try and make sure I've got consistency in my results. Remember, if you're going to use any methodology that's going to start sampling, set a seed. It's really important for write-ups, there's nothing worse, and we've all done it, that you, you have your data and you do it and you write your report, and you say, you can see this point in the top left, and then you run your R mark down the neck and time, and that point in the top left disappears. So set your seeds at the start of your R mark down, just so you have consistent results. I have done it, I've, I've spent ages typing up a paragraph, and then the next time I run an R mark down, the results, because there was something involved, it disappeared, I went, fuck, set seed. Also, it makes sure we, your research reproducible. When you write papers, when you put your code on GitHub and you're sharing it, set C so people can get exactly the same results as you do. Cool. Anyway, so there's a tune parameter. You can give it a, you say, here is the method I want you to tune, in this case, support vector machines. You then need to define your model, so Y tilde dot, here's the data. And then what you do is you go, here's the kernel, and now you can see I'm giving it a list of possible costs. So I've just done 10 times. So I've done 0 0.001, 0 0.01, 0 0.1, 1, 5, 10, 100. It goes away of each of those costs. It uses cross-validation. It's using a tenfold cross-validation. And it will tell me the best parameter. So in this case, it found the best one for fitting this data under cross-validation is 0.1 for that cost. You can then grab your summary of that model. So it's got 16 support vectors, eight for one side and eight for the other side. There's two classes. Um, it's a linear, it's a C classification. You've got all your information there. And then you could do that, you know, look at that model, use it, etc. Can you go for more classes? Yes, but I haven't in this one, yeah. I believe. So I think you end up with, if you have K classes, you will have K choose two separating hyperplanes. It just seemed odd that they have like an output for yeah. a number of. No, I think you can do more classes. And then there's two different ways to do it. You can do like one versus rest for all of them. Yeah. To get all of your decisions in hyperplanes. Yep. And then there's a weird one where you do them all together. No, that's weird. Yeah. I, no, I, I didn't bother looking at that. Fine. So here I've simulated some data that is non linear. You've got this nice bit of data in the center, which is all your blue class. And then as it gets further out, you end up with this one class. So now you can see that you know, a linear hyperplane is not going to cut it in this one. So the classic one which you get beyond linear is to go and do the um, radial one, which was the third one in that generalized inner product. And remember, Ashley said, what's the gamma? The gamma, again, is a tuning parameter. So I've got two tuning parameters now. I've got my cost. And I've got my gamma. But other than that, you fit it pretty much the same. You've got your kernel, you take the radio, you take data, it's still got the formulae. And here is my one that fits on that one. So you can now see, now if you think about it, if you went to the radial dimension, that is just a hyperplane. That is a flat structure in that dimension. When I come back to my dimension, the x1, x2, I get this weird knife. It's a nice convex, it's not quite convex is it? No, but it's a nice shape, it looks pretty good, you've got that. You can see you've still got your support vectors, etc. So the concept's the same, it's just that once we're looking at it in just x1, x2, and now you see you're starting to get really complicated structures. And you can get really complicated structures. You know, if I now change my cost up to 10,000, my gamma equals one, and now I fit that model, now you can see, I don't just have a single region that's blue and a single region that's red, I've got a couple of blue regions. It's still 
in the radial dimension, basically a soft separating hyperplane. If I went to that dimension and I had a look at it, it would still look like a flat surface. But once it comes back down, it basically starts crinkling up and breaking itself down. So do we know how many dimensions are in the radial transform? Because like the, the <sighs> yeah. quadratic thing would have 2p, right? But yeah, I don't know off the top of my head. Sorry, I really have to look It just works it out. Yeah, it does it. It does it. Let's yeah. say we've got to the point of black magic. Yep. Every so often we're going to kill a chicken or a goat, mm. but it's black magic. And this is the problem, it does look like black magic. You try and explain, one of you will have to, for your presentations. <laughs> Don't worry, I'll be randomising them sometime this week. But you're excited, aren't you? <laughs> but how do you explain that picture to a domain expert? You know? I mean, I would avoid the picture. I would say, it will take into account the fact that the separation might be tricky, but I mean, I probably wouldn't use the word for, well, it depends on the collaborator, it's a straight line in fucked up dimensions, but that's all it is. I would probably start saying, you know, here's how you separate the points, but imagine I wanted a curve that did that. We can do that. Is there a concept of overfitting in this? Always, yeah. If you, if you go to a high enough dimension, every single point can have its own little region in that dimensional space and you can just predict for that region the point it actually is. Yeah, so definitely. So this one must be overfit, right? Because the cost was outrageous. outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to tune it. Yeah, right. Nice point. You must stop looking ahead in these slides. <laughs> so we can tune it. But now we have two parameters we want to tune. And I've only explored a very small space. I may only explain a small space here because I didn't want lots and lots of output, that's all. But you could explore that space. So now you can see I use tune. I tell you that I want to support vector machine. I tell you that my response variable is Y, the predictors of everything else. I'm going to use radial. Radial has two tuning parameters, cost and gamma. And so I choose various values. I actually initially choose lots and lots of values to find the range. Ended up finding that these were nice values and then just reduced it down for my output because I didn't want this table at the bottom just to go off my slide, that's all. But you can just fit it, look at it, and it will now tell you the best parameter. The best parameter for cost is the point one. So you said you want to be careful with having too much cost. Gamma is one. So according to cross-validation, this is what my space should look like. What's this version in the app? Dispersion is a measure of RSS, residual sum of squares. So it's a measure of, um, another measure of your error. Yeah, if you want to have a look, go and look at the help file, it will tell you the details. Look at the details section. Because the, the, the one you chose has the largest dispersion with the smallest error. Yeah, I went on error on this one. Mm. That's what it chose as well. Yeah. So there's the best model. Really, really good for prediction. So this look really, really nicely for prediction. You can really tune it. Although you do have to stop and go, I still would say look at the data, if you can. And we'll look at some methods next week when we get to PCA about how you can look at your data when you have a lot of predictors. So I decided to do an example of real data. So we'll go back to the heart data. So I read in the heart data, I convert my AHD, the acute heart disease, into a factor. And then I decided just to make it easy, I would just look at selecting age, sex, and um, cholesterol. So here I've got my ID, I've got my HD, age, sex, and cholesterol. So we want to predict for that. And I've also removed my missing values. <laughs> so I split it. I'm going to split it into a training set and a testing set. So I've just split it, um, I've taken altogether 200 for my train, the rest are my test using the anti-join on ID. Set my seed. And so the first one, I just fitted an LDA, linear discriminant analysis. I've then fitted a linear support vector machine and then I've tuned it and got the best model. I've also done a radial, tuned it, got the best model. And then, this is the ROC curve for the test data. 
I was a bit disappointed with this. I was hoping that my support vector machine would be brilliant. Although I'm suspicious that if you went back and looked at the data, you would find that generally with all these things, they probably separate quite nicely. That is, the linear is as good as anything else. And then, hence, first of all, the radio doesn't do. You don't need that non-linearity in your model. And when it comes to the linear, the LDA and the support vector machine are pretty well doing the same thing. Bantry LDA, it's fast, it's easy, people understand it. But, you know, maybe if we started having more predicts in there, we would find that it all fell apart. I was hoping this would be a great example of how good support vector machines is. And then I got my ROC curve and we just went, oh, fuck. Um, I mean, at certain points it does seem to do better. The radial does seem to do better between the, the 0.5, etc. But generally, I think the AUC of that is pretty similar. Good take home message for that is just because it's fancy doesn't mean you should do it. And remember the two rules of data science all models are wrong, but some are useful. Model early, model often. You know? Hopefully you get to the point now that you feel so confident, you just go, right, I'll do an SVM. I'll do SVM of these three different things. I will tune it. I will go and do LDA, QDA, tune it. You know, you know of a classification medal, do all of them. And every time we saw this um, on Monday, the same, if the same predictors keep coming up, or you, say, you keep getting the same sort of things, great. But if you find you change your method and everything suddenly changes, you're probably just modeled noise. You have a model signal. Cool. A support vector machine. Next week we'll start unsupervised learning with a bit of PCA and clustering and MDS, multi-dimensional scaling. I've got a really cool diagram. I was so excited yesterday. You won't find it as cool as me, but I'll show you next week at some point. No, the week after we'll do MDS. Yeah, you suffer it. You just have to. When I go, oh, this is so cool. You all have to go. Yes, it's so cool, Jono. <laughs> Yay! Sorry, at least one person. In this course, he's enjoying himself. It's a that shame it's the lecturer, not the students. <laughs> cool. Any questions? Brilliant. Uh, don't forget, we have a workshop this Friday. We're going to do S3 object oriented programming. See you all Friday. Can you just see those kernels? Take me back. <laughs> you can succinctly define the need of the kernel if it's in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space <laughs> with a reproducing property of the NPA I learned over summer. <laughs> You know that dumb course we did? Yeah. yeah that was did they do support vector machines? Yeah, but. <laughs> nah, not really. But with Hilbert spaces. Yeah, I had to prove, like, um, is Hilbert space, prove that it's dense, prove that it's complete. I was Isn't a Hilbert space just basically a subspace that's got a metric? Yes, pretty much. Yeah, he could have said but, that, but. <laughs> but that's something that we had to discover on our yeah. own. <laughs> It was an organic learning. Yeah, if you've ever driven a car, you've discovered that on your own already. <laughs> if you just said, do you live in Australia? Well done, Hilbert Space. <laughs> Can I ask you like, a dumb question? Of course you may. Excellent. It might take a while. That's all right. Let me just stop this, and then we can... Then you just don't have your recorded questions all over this. <laughs>